my, my name is John Stuart Reed, and I'm an acoustic physics uh, researcher. And um, I've spent the last 40 years, I think, four decades of my life uh, researching sound. So um, it's a topic which uh, is very dear to my heart. Why? Because sound underpins every aspect of the universe, or almost every aspect of the universe. The only place in the universe where there is no sound is in very rare gases. These are gases where the molecules or the atoms are so far apart that they're not colliding with each other. But whenever you have uh, gases or matter that we think of as solid matter, but whenever you have matter on Earth, for sure, then the atoms and the molecules are always having elastic collisions, and that is actually a definition of sound. So in other words, sound underpins everything on this Earth. Fantastic. So that's why maybe you've also been using sound all the way back in the Egyptian times and you know something about this, don't you? Correct? Well, I do because uh, um, my dad and I used to visit uh, Egypt many, many times. And on one of the occasions, we, um, we found ourselves in the Great Pyramid and in the King's Chamber, which has such special acoustic properties. This was actually in early 1996. And, uh, you know, 22 years ago or whatever now. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that particular occasion, I lay in the sarcophagus, and which you're not supposed to do, it's a bit naughty. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. No. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I did, many people do. And I made a vocal glissando, and at one particular frequency, a low, a low pitch, um, that I thought was somewhere around 100 hertz, um, every cell in my body seemed to tingle and there was this energy that was washing up and down my body from the standing waves created by my own voice lying in that sarcophagus. And so this kind of tingly effect that I received gave me the impression that this was a design feature of the pyramid and uh, that this was not accidental, it was not happenstance, that somehow they had designed this. So. Um, that really got my attention and, and inspired me to go back the same year, 1996, later in the year, to conduct a series of acoustics experiments in the Great Pyramid. And then I went back again in 97, uh, because I could not complete all of the experiments in 96. And uh, it was actually the 97 experiments that really changed my life forever. Because um, three weeks before going out to Egypt for the 97 experiments, I severely injured my lower back and I was in a lot of pain and I at one point thought I would have to cancel the mission to Egypt and uh, but in the end I just gritted my teeth and took some lots of painkillers and um, and managed to get into the Great Pyramid other people carried the equipment in and so on and uh, but what happened this experiment that I conducted in 97 was essentially to make the resonances in the sarcophagus this granite box, which is 3.7 tons of granite hollowed out, um, to make those resonances visible because when you strike the sarcophagus with your, say, the side of your fist, uh, it rings like a low-pitched bell. You know, granite is, this particular granite from Aswan is very rich in quartz uh, crystal, about 20% or 25% even quartz crystal, so it's a very resonant material. And, um, and I wondered if the resonance had somehow contributed to this amazing effect that I had experienced a year earlier. So uh, the, the, the experiment uh, was designed to make those resonances visible. And the way I uh, designed the experiment was to stretch a membrane across the open top of the sarcophagus and to weight it around the perimeter with little bags of sand, which I had collected outside the pyramid. <laughs> They've got lots of sand in, uh, in Egypt, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, to create an even torsion across the surface of the membrane. And then in the bottom of the sarcophagus, I placed a small loudspeaker connected to an electronic oscillator. And then the, the final component is to sprinkle on some more sand onto the membrane itself. in the sarcophagus and what happens, what I expected to happen, that I would get some kind of random patterns showing me the vibrations made visible in the sarcophagus. But two things happened. First one was 
that I began to see what looked like ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs appearing in the sand. In sand from sound? From sound. And um, I was very excited, you know, seeing these what looked like ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. And the antiquities inspector also got very excited. He was with me. And, um, and he said, how can I help you? You know, what can I do to help? And so suddenly he, he had been transformed from a very bored man watching this crazy Englishman, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. So suddenly wanting, he was animated and he wanted to help. And anyway, so um, about 20 minutes into this uh, amazing series of experiments, uh, all the pain in my back left me completely gone. Bearing in mind that most of the frequencies that I was creating in the sarcophagus were low, low tones, very low frequencies. Um, and then I suddenly noticed I was bending over, looking at the sand move on the surface of a membrane. And as I was changing the frequency to some new frequency, and then suddenly, I, I just suddenly consciously realized no pain in my back. So in that moment, I actually thought that Okay, I'm very happy, I'm very excited. Uh, my bloodstream is obviously flowing with endorphins and I believe that the endorphins were masking the pain effectively. Um, and, and so my in my consciousness I thought, oh, when I uh, finally complete these experiments and go outside the pyramid, the pain's going to come back. But actually the, the pain never did come back. So, you know, I realized in that moment that something kind of almost magical had happened. Two things magically happened. First of all, to see these hieroglyphs was astonishing. And then to realize that all the pain had gone, and especially later outside the pyramid and going back to the hotel and so on, never came back that pain. So I realized that, that uh, two things. First of all, that this experimental design could become a new scientific tool uh, for investigation of anything that's resonant. That's the first thing. And then the second thing was, I realized that uh, sound had obviously been involved, was the prime mover in, in causing the pain to, to vanish completely. Having been in pain for three weeks up to this point, so that changed my life in two ways. You know, one was uh, to design an instrument that would be using these same kind of techniques, cymatic techniques, the, the, the science of visible sound. And then secondly, to begin investigating uh, the mechanisms that uh, underpinned my own healing. Why had that happened? Why had, how had this low frequency sounds that I was creating, how had they suddenly created a situation where my cells were happy enough to release the spasm in my lower back mm -hmm. and to cause the pain to just disappear? And so it is, this journey that I've been on uh, ever since then has been concerned with the development of the cymoscope instrument, which is what we call the instrument that makes sound visible. No longer using sand, of course, we now use water as the imprinting medium, so we imprint sound onto water. And what that does is it transposes the, what we would call the sonic periodicities, you know, the vibrations in air that we call sound. These sonic periodicities can be transposed into water mm -hmm. to create what we would call water wavelet periodicities. So now what we have in the water is a kind of model of the sound. It's, a, it's, it's really the sound made visible. And, and of course, you know, our visual acuity is such that when we can see something, we can understand it at a far better and deeper level. That's how the world is made. Yeah? Exactly, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words. Yes. And cymoscope pictures, especially when you see them in a dynamic form, in a video form, uh, speak 10,000 words. There's so much happening in the water when you see a sound made visible that suddenly we can understand it at a much better level than we can with conventional acoustic instrumentation. Yeah. So I would like to ask you, when you did this hieroglyph in the inside the pyramid, yes. was it a square you put this, the skin on? Or? Well, yes, the, the sarcophagus is rectangular. Yes, it's, it's a rectangular. rectangular. So I thought, could you also get a hieroglyph in England if you would make it? You know, maybe it was all this, the all the resonant, all the room that was well, made for that hieroglyph. I think, I think uh, it's a good question, Gita, but I think I think not. No. And the reason is because my um, my hypothesis, you know, how some people would think, okay. 
the, the, the ancient Egyptians had some kind of special high technology and they've embedded uh, hieroglyphic um, features into the, into the sarcophagus. That is not my hypothesis. Mm. You know, my hypothesis is that, that all sounds, um, when, you, when they encounter a membrane, create a pattern. Yeah. This is, these are the laws of physics. Yes. If you have sound, sound and you have yeah. a membrane, you have to have a pattern. Of course, we don't see it. It's invisible. But with special lighting and special conditions, we can make the pattern visible, okay? Mm. So in the case of the uh, sarcophagus, my hypothesis is that the rich harmonic sounds that are created by Aswan granite, you know, the granite that, that they yeah. used for the Great Pyramid came from Aswan, which oh, is so it was 500 the kilometers to the south. It's the only place in Egypt where they have this granite and they had to bring it up the Nile. I think it's 500 kilometers to the, uh, to the Giza site. Yeah. The, the crystals in that granite contain specific resonances. Yes. And when you make those resonances visible, they, they look like hieroglyphs. Now, how, is this, uh, how does this connect with actual hieroglyphs? And my hypothesis is, uh, is very simple. The, the, the sarcophagus itself w w would be brought to the work site at Giza, having already been completed in Aswan. So they quarry the, uh, the granite in Aswan, and then they, all the work that they do to prepare that sarcophagus is also completed in Aswan. Okay, that's where the workmen would be working. Mm -hmm. uh, why would they do it that way? Well, because it's um, a 3.7 ton granite box when it's hollowed out. Yeah. You can imagine how heavy that is. Now, how could they get it? When it, it also that's a different question. But, also but, but, you know, to, to get it to, to take it yeah. to Cairo, to Giza, it would be much heavier as yeah. a solid block. Yeah, 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 so may, may as well, you know, do the work on it yeah. to, to hollow it out in Aswan. Okay, so when you, what happens is when you use a tool um, to, against granite to begin to hollow it out, any tool that you use, it doesn't have to be metal, they very often used very uh, dense balls of, um, uh, of stone um, called uh, dolerite, the, these dolerite stones, when you when you uh, hit granite with them, the granite rings like a bell, like I was explaining earlier. It mm. has this kind of ringing mm. sound. Now, um, there's two possible scenarios that I see. What happens when you create this sound from granite in Aswan? You you've got these men working on the granite to hollow it out, okay? There are two possible uh, hypotheses. One is that the sounds that are being created are impinging on the workman, but also on the scribe who is standing by the side of the workman measuring the work. You know, in Egypt, when there was no money, they did not use money in Egypt. The workmen were paid with food, with uh, salt, with uh, beer, with bread. You know, these were the, these were the commodities that, that were paid to the workmen. But they were, they were paid in accordance with the amount of work that they did. So they would always have a scribe standing by whose job it was, you know, to measure the work. Okay, how many hours are you doing on this sarcophagus, whatever. So as the scribe is standing there making a note of the work, um, he is receiving the sounds yeah. from the granite that's being, yes. you know, struck with yes. this ball. And, and these sounds contain, um, w when they impinge on a membrane, yeah. they contain geometry, as we've seen. Mm -hmm. So um, every cell in the body of that scribe has a membrane. Yeah. Every cell yeah. has a membrane. Okay. Like any human body, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so he, and, and also your skin is a membrane. Yes. So he's receiving these patterns all of the time. Yeah. Every time the ball is struck on the granite, mm. he's receiving these patterns. Now, maybe not consciously, but at some subliminal level, he is receiving the pattern. And so he goes away to his, uh, his uh, you know, his home at night, and he sleeps. And as he's sleeping, he's thinking about these patterns 
at some level mm. that he has seen. Mm. And he thinks, hmm, this pattern, this is a good pattern. I will use this pattern yeah. to create um, hieroglyph mm -hmm. for language. Yes. Okay. So it just so happens that the very first time in Egypt that they were working with granite, uh, according to the Egyptological view, is 3,900 BCE. This is the date in history when granite was first worked in Aswan. Okay? And it's according to the Egyptological view, it's actually exactly the same date when the hieroglyphic language was first being developed. So I don't think that's a coincidence. I think, uh, I mean, it could be a coincidence, but I don't think it is. I think what's happened is they start to work with the granite in Aswan. The scribes are standing there. They are receiving these wonderful, rich harmonic sounds. Yeah. And it will be higher and higher. So, and, yes. Know, lower and lower, the more they will. <laughs> yes, and at, and at some level, you know, subconsciously yeah. or consciously, I don't know, they, you know, they, res they, they see yeah. these patterns. That's one hypothesis. The other one is even simpler. It's just that um, around the same date in history, again, it seems like a big coincidence, but according to the uh, history, around that same date is when the, the first evidence of drums, you know, the, yeah. a drum that you would use in music, first evidence of drums being used in Egypt. Mm. May, maybe they used them earlier than 3,900, but there's no actual evidence, you know, where you've literally got a, 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 me, a drum that you found archaeologically and you've been able to date it. Mm -hmm. So so the first drums are also found around that same date. So let's say they have a drum in the in the quarry where the men are working with the stone and they're working with the granite. Um, and um, let's say that, that there's some sand on top of this drum and that they're making these sounds and, then they and then they're seeing patterns yeah, yeah. on these drums. Yeah form and and the, the scribe is looking at these patterns yeah, and of course because thinking, there's so much sand it could be laying on oh just blowing yeah. on you yeah. know and then they're looking at these patterns and they're thinking hmm this is an interesting pattern no, it's it's from god you know in, in a sense gods, yes probably when the, it's when it's coming every time they hear it they know? would certainly think it was magic i mean yeah. in a sense it is from god because you know vibra yeah. all vibration all is. is god yeah. so uh, anyway that that's the uh, hypothesis and then um so that kind of explains the existence of the hieroglyphs on the sarcophagus, that, you know, the, what looked like hieroglyphs on the sarcophagus. Because and I was thinking, also the ancient symbols, you know, in India and all that, these kinds of things, they have also been shown in that the phonetics, also, you know, and I'm thinking, oh... Is know, there a connection there? Yeah, it is, because yeah. they, they some... Hengieni, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that make them cymatics, he also made some of them, I mean, it's amazing. Yes, I think there is a connection. Yeah. I, I have not um, conducted any research. No, but a which the... sound will do it and under which con conditions, you know, because I think it's very interesting because we must have also a pattern for each of us if, and, and equal things and if I then uh, well, individual, you know? Well, you're absolutely right, Gita, because, you know, the cymoscope instrument now, using water yeah. as the imprinting medium, just pure, Human, pure yeah. water, every person has a unique voice. I mean, we know this yeah. anyway. You know, you, you pick up the phone and someone yeah. speaks to you and says, uh, hello, Gita, yeah. and, uh, and you immediately know who, who that is. is. Yeah. They don't have to say, you know, no their name you yeah. know from yeah. the sound yeah. and so even with the low the narrow bandwidth yes. of the telephone instrument you still know yeah. who the person is you know without them saying so every every person's voice is unique to them what the cymoscope instrument allows us to do yeah. is to uh, i know we have some yeah, little yeah, noise yeah, in the background okay, but okay. no worries yeah. what the cymoscope instrument allows us to do is to make that sound visible and so we, we call that a voice mandala. Oh, yeah. So using the Indian term mandala, this yeah. is a voice mandala. Yeah. And what we see when we look at a voice mandala is unique geometry for every person. Yeah. So your voice mandala is mm. completely different to my voice mandala. Mm. We all have a unique voice mandala. And that voice mandala is a kind of, uh, it's almost like a blueprint for our DNA yeah. because it's really yeah. our DNA which gives us our unique voice. And therefore, we can relate the voice mandala back to the DNA. So maybe that could be an idea that when 
let's say I have a student or somebody in the workshop that we we're singing ourselves free of trauma sometimes. If you had yeah. the the mandala before and after because the voice changed. Sometimes you could simply hear the voice get softer and this this something like a little bit little bit high tension yes. disappear after. Oh you you absolutely that could correct. be exciting um, to do this. You may know of the work of uh, Shari Edwards. Yes, yes you know, I know. Yes and you know her instrument um, shows us these differences because you're right, when you have an illness your voice the character of your voice changes. In fact my voice now I can because we've been here three Three days. Yes. Um, uh, we're quite tired. Yes. You know, I, I know I am tired. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I can actually hear this in my own it's voice. It's very intensive. I mean, I, you can't shift the gear now. No, you're no, in the, no. I, you I, couldn't I, go in and swim or have any. No. So so if, that if, if I made my voice visible yeah. now with the cymoscope instrument yeah. and and then and then looked at it in three days time, yeah. perhaps when I rested, yes. it would be quite a bit different. Yes. The main geometry would be very similar. Yeah. But the little frills, the little frilly uh, aspects of the mandala around the perimeter, yes. they would change with the character of my voice. And so you're, you're right, you know, if you take someone who has an illness and then uh, however they uh, uh, become well again, whether through the use of sound mm -hmm. or other modalities, mm -hmm. when they are well and you then check your voice pattern again, the voice mandala, you would see a significant difference in that voice mandala. Yeah. So maybe it even could could be used as a kind, if you knew all the illnesses, you know, like you have the iris analyze, how you call it in English, when you look at the eye, yes. like a mandala, also to see the illnesses, you know, people... Oh yes, be, iridology. Iridology, iridology okay. yes. maybe it could be used like this with a voice. It could, it probably could, yes, that, that, I think that I, I see that happening some years, yes. you know, in the Ahead. future, yeah. but yes, a definite possibility. And then you know you asked um, earlier. You were talking. We were talking about uh, sound therapy. You know how does uh, sound actually cause the body to heal? You know what is it? What is the what are the characteristics of sound that causes that to happen? And and how was I healed yes. in the Great Pyramid in 20 minutes? Only a short period of time. Um, and uh, it would probably take me quite a long time mm. to describe the whole process. But uh, in very simple terms, there, there are two mechanisms. The first one is, um, in, your, in your body, your whole body is covered in um, nociceptors. These are the nerve endings. You know, we have nerves everywhere. And uh, in the tips of our fingers, for example, you know, millions and millions of these little nociceptors, which is why um, our finger tips are so sensitive yeah. and this is why you know blind people can read braille and so on because the, the fingertips are just so sensitive but the whole body is covered in nociceptors. I'm sorry but that's where they feel it when you have when we have given sound healing to people they say why are my fingers are like they can tingling tingle. yeah it's tingling, exactly yes. tingling yeah. okay well, it's a very good point yeah. So talking about these nociceptors, which are the very ends of the nerves in your body, okay, they connect with um, fibers that are called afferent fibers. Mm -hmm. These afferent fibers are carrying, there's various types of afferent fibers, I'm not going into all the details, but there's various categories of afferent fibers, but all of them are all capable of being uh, stimulated by mechanical pressure. Yeah. This is why if you have a pain, say someone, um, you, you injure your leg in some yes. way and you have a severe pain in your leg, yeah. you immediately go to your leg and you hold yes. it tightly, yes. you put yes. pressure yes. on your leg or yes. your shoulder, you yes. hold it very tightly yes. and you find that this, this pressure that you put onto your, say your shoulder, it mediates the pain, it yeah. immediately gives you relief yes the you pain. hold it because you hold it. you hold it yeah now the reason that happens is because the nociceptors are sending signals when you put pressure on them the nociceptors are sending signals to the midbrain and what the midbrain does when it receives this these pressure sensors it creates opiates these are literally pain 
um, pain, pain mediating substances that block any further pain re reaching the midbrain. Mm. So it's kind of a way of, of uh, neutralizing or mediating the pain. So that's why the sound can do it the too. The sound does yeah. it because sound is mechanical pressure. Mm -hmm. And particularly yes. low frequency sound has a very, very beneficial yes. effect. I have that experience too. It just, my voice just started to make them. Yes. And in the first time, it's 25 years ago, it started to come. Yes. I want to sing normal, but it just started to uh, and the People said, "Oh, please, could you continue? It feels good, you know." Feels good. But I felt so ashamed by, it. and that's <laughs> the thing when we're doing this. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you have to get used to it. Yes, it doesn't yeah. sound so well, but it's after I did this, I mean, all kind of things got healed. Wonderful. And I well, had the same thing so, that in the bones, yes. like the back, mm -hmm. a broken fracture mm -hmm. can be healed like um, two thirds of the time. Exactly. In some cases. So, so the first mechanism is this low frequency sound. Yes. Um, across quite a, a large range of low frequencies, you know, um, from uh, well, the lowest the lowest note that a human being can make, a, a, a man, a bass yeah. you know, singer, is down to about 50 hertz, something like that, 50, 60 hertz. But with undertones. Oh yes, undertones as well. That's true. Yeah. But then, um, you know, may, the male voice range go up, goes up to you know quite a few hundred, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, and many many uh, women can sing down to. 100 hertz or even yeah. lower. So all those low frequencies are mm. beneficial for, first of all, pain mediation. So that's the first thing, right? Yes. It's important to remove the pain because when you remove the pain, the whole body yeah. can yes. relax, yes, you know, yes. because pain gives you tension. Yes. But then the other thing is that the when a system of the body has received trauma, in this case, you know, in my case, with yeah. my lower back, yeah. it had received trauma. Why? Because I had done something really silly. I had bent down at the wrong angle to lift something, twisted my spine yeah, at yeah. the same time as yeah. bending. That's really bad for a spine. Yes. And I'd injured, you know, the, the tissues in yes. my lower back. So all the muscles were mm. in this kind of spasm. Yeah. Now, what does that mean to the actual cells themselves, you know, in, in my tissues? What it meant was that the cells have gone into a kind of protection mode. Yeah. This protection mode uh, in biological terminology is called the G0 phase of the cell. And what it means is that the cell is sleeping. It's not it's no longer in the normal process of, of cell it's cycle. It's hibernating. It's kind of hibernating, yeah. right? It goes to sleep to protect itself and to heal. And, um, you know, if you visit a, a doctor and you've got a, a, a very s painful back condition, yes. he or she will probably tell you, well, what you need is rest. Yes. And actually, that is very correct, largely yeah. true. Correct, yeah. Be it is correct because it will take time for those cells to recover um, their energy and to come from G0 into what's called the G1 phase, yes. which leads to ultimately to replication, to mitosis of the cell and so on. But one, while the cells are in the G0 phase, the body creates protection for that area of your back and your, that area of your back will go into a spasm to try to stop movement happening, yes. just yes. so you can have yes. the healing, okay? So um, the surface of every cell in your body, so mm -hmm. now we're talking about the cells in my, my lower yeah. back, yeah, yeah. the surface of every cell has um, hundreds, sometimes thousands of little projections yes. that come out of the cell membrane. Yes. And these little projections are called integral membrane proteins. Oh. Okay. And some of them, not all of them, but some of them are sensitive to sound and some of them are sensitive to light. Okay, they're like little antennae. They so it's out. good to be in the light and do sound actually. Yes. So, so um, what happens when sound, in this case, like, in the Great Pyramid, these yes. low frequencies yes. that I was creating, yeah. when they were entering my body, now you can visualize a pattern that's actually surrounding the cell. And one of the things that I've noticed when making sound visible with the cymoscope instrument is that the pattern is very often rotating. It's not static. It's a kind of rotational effect. I'm not going to go into all the physics you know, why that is. But the important thing to know about this is that when these low frequencies are entering your body and surrounding, literally creating a pattern on every cell, that pattern is almost always 
gyrating, it's moving backwards and forwards. And now you get this kind of uh, thought that this pattern of energy that's literally imprinted onto the cell membrane is kind of massaging the little integral membrane proteins. Mm -hmm. It's just gently massaging them. And what it's doing, I think, is it's saying to the cell, it's okay, you can wake up now, yes, you yes. know, here is some energy, here's yeah, some gentle yeah. energy, it's okay to wake up. Yeah. And so the cell thinks, ah, oh, I feel much more comfortable now, yeah. you know, and so as soon as the cell comes out of the G0 phase and starts to go into the G1 phase, it also sends a message to that area of the body to release the spasm. So the spasm that was blocking my lower mm. back, after 20 minutes, that spasm goes. Yes. And all the cells in that area of my body wake up again, yeah. and they think all is well, yes. and all was well, because yes. the pain never came back. So that's a kind of very, uh, you know, um, broad brush yes, yes. Uh, kind of snapshot of how sound therapy so, actually works. So the sound actually can treat all what has to do with this tension or this hibernating cells. Yes. Do. But if there's a fracture, it will take a little bit more time or, or, fractures. or something where most, you know, because that's why I, I never say I can be sure that it will work because there are certain things that it will take more time yes. and the, the sound will probably help it to heal faster, but it takes more time. Yeah, for broken, for yeah. broken bones and yeah. Fractures, of course, but yes. you, but but certainly, um, even in the uh, mainstream medical yes. model, uh, ultrasound, which is simply high frequency sound, yes. is used particularly for fractures uh, where, say, you you've, you've broken your arm in some yeah, way, and then you you've done something really silly. You you've got a, a plaster cast on your arm, yes. but then you lift something heavy with it, and you should not. No, but you've done that, and you you've. Um, change this, the way that the body is trying to yeah. mend this fracture. Yes, yes. And so what happens very often when a fracture is disturbed in that way, the body stops the healing process completely, yes. just stops it. Yeah. And so you go back to the hospital um, with this, you know, silly thing that you've done to your arm when you've already had yeah. the plaster cast on, and the only thing the hospital can do is to give you sound. They give you high frequency sound, ultrasound. To, and to that kind of like, kickstarts yeah. the process of yes. healing again, uh, and yeah. um, but equally low frequency sound can have the same beneficial yeah. effect. Yeah. And this is why there are many stories um, from uh, the Aboriginals of Australia yes. Yes. using the didgeridoo, you know, yes. the Yadaki yes. instrument, yes. to heal broken bones. Same reason, the beautiful low frequencies that they make um, can actually speed up the rate of bone uh, fractures and maybe even if people are stressed you know maybe you can be lucky i had some coincidence uh, where, where we found the place in the body where it's placed yes. where it's a tension yes and a mixture of me healing with the undertones and them singing self free of the traumas that caused this or maybe they they crossed their limits you know yes and, and then they were free i think the same process is probably at work because stress causes um, tension in the body, yes. the muscles tense up. Yes. These are spasms that, you know, that are, again, the body is trying to protect yes, itself. Like the, like the autonome system probably yes. said, okay, now it's enough. You, know, yes. you, you don't know how to handle it, to but, listen to me. But you the, know? Sound, <laughs> the sound that you're creating, whether with your own voice yeah. or with some external yeah. instrument, could be you know, a Tibetan bowl or a crystal bowl or a, or a harp or yeah. a piano or any kind of instrument yeah. that creates uh, sound. Can, can enter the body and cause the cells in the body to receive that energy yeah. and to relax and yes. to leave go of the tension, basically. So sound is very, very healing. In fact, sound, you know, it was Pythagoras who first said yes, yes. that sound could be used in place of medicine. Yeah. Uh, was his biographer, one of his biographers, I am Blickus, who said that, he, it's, that Pythagoras said sound could be used in place of medicine. And it just so happens to come full circle yeah, back yeah. to where we were talking about ancient Egypt, yes, yes. that Pythagoras traveled in Egypt. So it's quite possible, I think, it's possible that oh, Pythagoras um, w was given a lot of knowledge about acoustics and, and healing from the ancient Egyptians. And then he goes back to, uh, to his home and starts to teach you know, what he learned in ancient Egypt. I'm very sure about that.